how good it is to see you all once again. And how good it is to be able to come and stand in your midst and say a few things instead of sending a uh, video or an audio of my voice. It's good to be able to stand before you. For those of you who say, who is that man? <laughs> All of our youthful people who have come and assembled in this place for a while. I'm the person that's listed as the pastor. <laughs> and I heard Reverend Addison say, well, you, he, he is the pastor. But I have been away for a while. That's why you haven't seen me on a regular basis. And we're always having different people uh, to come in that I'm led to invite, and I'm glad that they always come in and do a great job. Uh, so I am that person. <laughs> and I feel well enough on this day to be in your presence. And uh, I'm going to ask that we all join together in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, there are so many things that we can focus on as we pray. So many words from your sacred writings that we can lift up and quote. Yeah. But on this Youth Day Sunday, the words come to mind. Remember the Creator during the days of your youth. And we are still all young because we are children of God. So, Lord, we remember you. We remember you during the days of our youth. We ask that our youth have that word planted in their heart and in their spirit. They remember you as they come and participate in church activities, that they remember you as they learn about you through being in church, through the study of the word, through different activities, let them remember you always during the days of their youthful youth, before the difficult days come. And it's hard to find great joy and pleasure in them. We ask, O oh Lord, that you be our spiritual coach, our mentor, throughout all of our ages. Be there for us, Lord, yes, Lord, encouraging us to make different moves, to develop different mindsets, yes, to Help develop us. different approaches and ways to do what we do so that we can be effective in the present age and beyond. Yes. Oh, Lord, we ask your blessings upon us for those who are praying for different things. We know, oh, Lord, that you want us to be prosperous, and we believe that prosperity is certainly coming our way. At the same time, while we're being prosperous, let it be that our souls are being made more and more prosperous each time we meet. Let it be, O oh Lord, that each time we meet, it's a time for iron to sharpen iron, for goodness to rub off on somebody else, that we are better for being in each other's presence instead of being worse. Let it be, O oh Lord, that we can always come together and give you praise and honor. We ask your blessings upon us as we strive to be a church that is in transition sometime between one generation to another. But still, Lord, let it be that we are about your business in all seasons. We ask your blessings upon us. We pray and ask it in the strong and matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen, 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 amen. and amen. Thank God for you. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's put our hands together one more time for, for the youth. We certainly give honor to God today, to God the Father, who is our creator, to his son, our redeemer, and to his precious spirit, our sustainer, to the whole Godhead body. We certainly give glory and honor on this morning. I would, if you we all, if you all would join me in a wondrous way in celebrating your pastor. Um, Pastor Owens, 
I said in a wonderful way. Come on, y'all can do better than that. In a wonderful, wonderful way. Twenty-four years tirelessly serving. He has become somewhat of an inspiration uh, to me and for me. I know many don't know, but I try. Both of us get busy, but I try to talk once, at least once every couple of weeks or so. I just get on the phone and talk for a minute, try to pray. He encourages. Oddly enough, he ends up encouraging me. I, I call to check on him, but uh, a wealth of wisdom and one who I found to be um, like a godfather, big brother. Um, tells it like it is, and I appreciate it so often. Um, I don't consider myself young, but I don't consider myself old either. Those of us who are traveling and learning this art and process of preaching don't have many people to call on and count on anymore. Um, but I can say with all assurity, 99 times out of 100 when I call, he answers or he calls me back. And so I appreciate you, sir. God bless you. Thank you so much. Amen. Brother Mike, can I get a little bit more? There we go. You already knew what I was going to say. God bless you. Listen, I am thoroughly excited um, to be here, um, to be home. Um, again, it is always a pleasure coming to share with you all. Um, if you will, allow me a moment of personal reflection before I endeavor to take a text. Um, I came in, um, some of you probably see me, I'm moving a little slow. Um, hopping a little bit. I'm just asking for your prayers. I just had knee surgery not too long ago. Um, and when we talked and I agreed to come, the surgery was supposed to be back in January, but due to some unforeseen circumstances, I had to move it to just, what, two Thursdays ago, or one Thursday ago. Um, and so I am a believer that God's grace is sufficient and his mercy is everlasting. So you all pray with me. I want to um, take a moment to just, um, I, I was trying to sit in there looking out in the audience and see, of course, familiar faces from, from all over the place, but some very special faces in the house. They did not stand, um, but I got a lot of family in here today. I didn't even know what's coming. So all of you who are part of my family, I ain't going to try to call everybody name. If you would, just please stand. Come on, my dad is here. My mom is here. One of my oldest cousins is here. Two young cousins over here. Thank y'all so much. I didn't even, I wasn't expecting them uh, this morning. Um, and one who I can depend on, count on, who I trust and love. Um, I call him like a big brother, one of the esteemed deacons at the Brooklyn Baptist Church. Brother Deacon Richard Cunningham is here. This, raise your hand, Deacon. Every, every, when I'm somewhere, if he's available, he always shows up. And um, last and certainly not least, um, my wife is here this morning. Stand up, baby. Stand up. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, you need to stand up. Yeah. <laughs> and my two younger children are here. My older brother, Mark. Some of y'all ain't seen Mark. Stand up. Some of y'all ain't seen Mark in forever. My, my older brother. Truly, truly glad to be at home and be back in this space and place. Amen. Amen. Well, now that we got all that out of the way, let's get to what we came here for. Amen. For those of you who have your Bibles or your tablets, whatever you may be using, we want you to turn with us to the gospel, excuse me, turn us to the Old Testament book, the prophet Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah chapter number 53. We've heard this a time or two, um, somewhat familiar text, um, and we're going to see, as my granddaddy would say, see if we can go to an old well and dig up some fresh water. Isaiah chapter number 53, we're going to look at verses 4 through 7. And the word of God reads for his people on this wise, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him, stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. 
He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. I um, want to use a look at this whole little pericope here, and for the time that I was to share, I want to use for a subject, when caring for you is killing me. When I get to heaven, I'm going to sit down. When I get to heaven, I'm going to sit down. Well, when I get to heaven, sit down. Well, I'm going to sit down and rest a little while. Come on, y'all help me. To heaven, I'm going to sit down. Well, when I get to heaven, I'm going to sit down. Well, when I get to heaven, oh, I'm going to sit down and rest. I want to take us back a little bit. Come on, let's have country church. Y'all ain't got that dignified and uppity that you can't have real church no more. There was a time when there wasn't no carpet on the pews and on the floor, and we didn't have no organ and no drums, and this is how we would have church. We would just clap. Come on. Well, when I get to heaven, I'm going to sit down. Well, when I get to for you is killing me. And brothers and sisters, y'all got to forgive me as I start off here, but there, there are a few things that uh, there are a few things that that I just can't stand. There, there, there are four things that I just cannot stand. A person who's a leech, a person who's a liability, a person who's lazy, and a person who's plain old low down. And I can't stand them because they always seem to show up at the most inopportune times with all kinds of issues, problems, and drama hovering all around them. It seems like issues, problems, and drama always seem to show up with people who are leeches, liabilities, lazy, or just low down. Have I got a witness here this morning? And I, I must admit that, that, that I don't even care to be around them or have them around me. And the reason I don't want them around is because uh, if you check out their characteristics, uh, you'll soon discover that once you have an encounter with a leech, a liability, a lazy person, or someone who's just low down, 
down, you'll discover that they become stuck on you like a leech and you can't get them off. A leech is a person that will suck the very life out of you. And all of us can testify that, that sometimes there are people in your life that, that can literally drain everything that you got on the inside. Have you ever met or talked to somebody that every time you're around them or you talk to them, you get fatigued, you get tired, and they talk you so much that you literally got to go home, take a nap, and say, Lord, I can't believe they caught me again. What about somebody who's a liability? A liability is somebody that can never come to the table with the same amount or the equal amount of resources that you do. But when they come, they're always asking for more than what they can give. And all of us in here know people like that. They always need help. They always want to borrow a little something, but can't never pay it back. Can't never pay their own way. Always in need of a helping hand. And no matter how much you help them and teach them how to fish, they they always depend on you to catch the fish, clean the fish, and cook the fish. And then sometimes they got the audacity to want you to feed them the fish as well. Tell you, I can't stand the leech. I can't stand a liability. But beyond, beyond all that, I can't stand a lazy Negro. Can I preach it like I want to? I know I'm homie. A lazy person will never do anything for themselves. They're always slowful. They're always major in procrastination. They can never get anywhere on time. Always depending on somebody else to cook, to clean, to comfort, and to console them. A lazy person is sluggish. They're slowful, and they're just plain old trifling. I can't stand a leech. I can't stand a liability. I cannot stand a lazy person, but I also can't stand somebody who's just plain old low down. A low down person is somebody that you just can't trust. Whenever they're around, you got to always look over your shoulder because you never know when they'll turn on you. You never know when they'll stab you in the back. All of us can testify that you got some low down folk that's around you in your life. And, and that's why you got to be careful of those folks that smile in your face. Y'all know the old song, don't you? Smile in your face all the time, want to take your place. Ain't nothing but some old backstabbers. And I tell you, when dealing with folk like that and you see them coming, you hope they don't see you because if they do, nine times out of ten, they don't want something from you. In fact, there are times in all of our lives that we've helped others so much that it literally drained us and sucked the very life out of us. I told you, brothers and sisters, as I started out, I had to get that off my chest. That I can't stand the leech, a liability, a lazy person, and I told you that I can't stand somebody who's plain all low down. But although I can't stand them, I know somebody who flocks to the very drama and issues that I desperately try to avoid. I know somebody that although I can't stand the leech, that although I can't stand a liability, I know somebody who can. And although I can't stand somebody who's lazy, I know somebody who can. And although I can't stand somebody who's low down, I know somebody who can and his name is Jesus. Is there anybody in here that can testify that Jesus can stand the leech? Oh, y'all want to sit out there and act like you ain't never been a leech before? You want to act like you ain't never been lazy? You want to sit out there and act like you ain't never been low down? But I'm looking at you, and if you be honest in here, all of us have been a leech at some point. All of us have something drained the very life out of each other. Somebody in here right now is mad to somebody. You don't even want to go home at night because that person has drained everything you got on the inside. Something the very life out of you. Let, let me bring this a little closer. Not only is somebody in your house a leech, but some of us in church have been a leech to God. I said some of us have been a leech to God. You always nagging, always complaining, always bringing the God down. Help me somebody. But not only have you been a leech to God, some of us have become a liability to God. We can't never bring to the table what God brings to the table. We become a liability to God, always depending on God more than God can depend on us. I mean, think about it. Can God really count on you? 
come on, I want you to roll that through your mind. Can, can God really count on you? See, you can count on God. You can count on God to wake you up in the morning, but can God count on you? You can you can count on God to provide a way out of no way, but can God count on you? You can you can count on God to open doors that you know should not be open. But the question becomes: Can God count on you just as much as you count on Him? Here it is. I know it's going to get quiet now, but we also been lazy. I said we've also been lazy. We don't want to work. Even though the Bible clearly says that a man that don't work shouldn't eat. We won't even work in church. We sit out there acting like we all has to did it, acting like people, people policemen, seek security, and, and bitch members. We don't even want to worship. We come to church and act like we too cool to clap, like we too sedated to shout, like we too poised to praise. I tell you, we've been lazy. And let me just say this so y'all don't think I'm leaving myself out preachers. We've been lazy too. Anytime you wait till Sunday to pray, pray and prepare a message, I tell you, you've been lazy. Deacons, let me call y'all roll as well. You, you, how you going to pray in church and you won't even pray at home? Cry, folks, I ain't leaving y'all out. Folks have been lazy. How you going to sing Zion songs but you won't come to rehearsal? I tell you, all of us have been lazy. I'm going to preach it like I want to this morning. But also, we've been low down. I said we've been low down, and not only have we been weak, which caused us to be low down, some of us have been wicked. But in spite of the wickedness, and in spite of the weakness, we ought to be able to lift our hands and bless the Lord, because the word declares that God commanded his love toward us, that while we were yet still in our sin, he died for us. Yeah. 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 The 53rd chapter in Isaiah stands out in the Old Testament as the single greatest prophecy of Jesus Christ. It stands out because it shares with us what God would accomplish for the sinner's past, his present as well as his future. This 53rd chapter is interesting because we learn about the life of our Savior, the death of our Savior, the triumph of our Savior, and the victory of our Savior. Here in the text, we are given a glimpse into the heart of God to see that God loves you and I so much that he was willing to go to any degree to pay any price for our redemption. In this text, beloved, I want you to notice that the name of Jesus is concealed. Watch this. The name of Jesus is not mentioned if you notice in this 53rd chapter, the name of Jesus is never mentioned. Although his name is concealed from us, his nature is revealed to us. Although his name is not mentioned, his nature is manifested. 41 times in this 53rd chapter, he's referred to as a pronoun, as he, him, and his. Watch this, verse number two, he's a man of sorrow. Verse number four, he's acquainted with grief. Verse number five, he's bruised for our iniquities. Verse number six, he takes our sins upon himself. Verse number nine, he made his grave with the rich. And then in verse number 10, he conquered death, I tell you, all Although his name is not mentioned, uh, his nature is manifested. And when I look at this text, there's something that stands out to me, y'all. There's something that captures my attention. What I see in the text is that he helps us. I know it ain't nothing real deep, but when I look in the text, it boils down to the simple fact that he helps us. And he helps us by doing three things. And I promise you, I'm going to speed to a close. First, the first reason or the first way that he helps us is uh, he helps us by lifting our burdens. I'm right there in the text. Hope you didn't close your Bibles. He says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He lifts our burdens, y'all. I said he lifts our burdens. I thought that would make some of y'all shout here. I said uh, that the Lord lifts our burdens. But I understand why some of you didn't shout because you're probably asking the same question that I asked. What, what the question is, what kind of burden is it? What, what burden is it that the Lord lifts for us? The answer according to the text is the burden of sin. Understand, y'all, 
I know some of y'all like to tiptoe around this thing and act like it ain't real. But understand that sin ain't no light burden. Come on, I wish y'all would talk back to me. Sin ain't no light burden. It's heavy. It's a heavy burden. Have I got a witness here? If the burden was light, we could all do it on our own. But the burden is heavy. And I don't know about you if I got about five or six of y'all in here who ain't the same. To be honest, you can say like me, I got some heavy stuff in my life. My sin ain't light. My junk ain't light. My issues ain't light. My drama ain't light. The Bible says that I'm a wretch undone, that I'm a hot mess. But thank God I got a Savior that don't mind carrying my load. The burden in this text is sin. I want y'all to watch this. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, that separated us from God. And because, and, and because that separated us from God, and because sin separated us, we needed a redeemer that would bridge the gap and become a mediator between a holy God and a hellish people. Now you got to understand that according to Genesis 3, we were in bad shape. Yeah. I said uh, that we, we were in bad shape. I, I said we were in very bad shape. Understand, watch this, that it was a woman, a man, and a tree that got us into trouble. Right. One more time for y'all in the balcony. It was a woman, a man, and a tree that got us into trouble. But look how God works. Although in Genesis 3, it was a woman, a man, and a tree that got us into trouble, God used the same thing that got us into trouble to get us out of trouble over the New Testament. It was a woman, a man, and a tree. Watch this. It was a woman named Eve, a man named Adam, and that tree that was in the garden that got us into trouble. But over in the New Testament, God used a woman named Mary, a man named Jesus, and an old rugged cross to get us out of trouble. I tell you, God shows up and changes things if we just sit down and rest a little while. Nobody else could lift that burden. No, nobody else could do for us what Jesus did. No, nobody else could stand in the gap and be that bridge uh, for, uh, or for us to come back to, our, to be our redeemer. Nobody else could do what he did. Let's run the road. Adam couldn't do it. He fell short in the garden. Noah couldn't do it. He liked too much Hennessy and Coke. Moses couldn't do it. He was a murderer. Jacob couldn't do it. He was a trickster and a slickster. Samson couldn't do it. He was a he-man with a she-weakness. David couldn't do it. He had a problem fall in love with desperate housewives by the name of Bathsheba. Solomon couldn't do it. He was a player from the Himalayas. Mark couldn't do it. Luke couldn't do it. Peter couldn't do it. He liked to cuss too much. Thomas doubted too much. And Jesus finally said, well, I'll go down and do it myself. He looked at his daddy and said, Daddy, prepare me a body and I'll go down and handle it myself. All those others could do was make a payment on what he did. I can remember y'all growing up right over there on Abraham Street. Yeah, we didn't have a lot. Mama worked hard as she could. Daddy worked hard as he could. But oftentimes we couldn't get all of the stuff that we wanted. Now, they just started back before a long time. They had got away with this. Y'all remember this little thing they used to have called layaway? Yeah. Yeah, and I remember we would go down and look through the stuff that we wanted, and Mama said, well, we can't get it all right now, but if you get it, we're going to take it to the back and put it on layaway, and Mama would bake, Mama would put some money down, but then sometimes stuff got hard, so Mama might call Daddy and have him to go make a payment. She might call my grandmama, have her to go make a payment, might call a cousin or auntie to make a payment, but guess what? When it came time to pick everything up, Mama didn't call nobody. She went down and paid it off herself. Y'all ain't catching what I'm throwing out. Is there anybody here that's glad that the Lord came through 40 and two generations and when nobody else couldn't pay for what you done, he didn't call nobody else, but he showed up. He showed up himself to pay the bill. I tell you, he lifts our burdens. I'm moving on, y'all. Not only does he lift our burdens, but he became liable for our bruises. I didn't make it up, I'm still in the text. In the text, this is what scholars call substitutionary atonement. In the text, in verse five, it says, 
but he was wounded. Watch this. Not for his transgressions. Now, not for his sin. Now, not for his mess ups and mistakes, but he was wounded for our transgressions. Bruised for our iniquities. He didn't sin, but he took on sin. Iniquity is the perverted mischief, blatant sin. He didn't do what we did, and yet in spite of what we did, he took it all upon himself. I thought I was in a church full of believers that ought to make somebody shout to, that when you could not and when you would not take it, that he stood in your stead and took what you wouldn't have been able to handle. Here, watch this. Let me get back. You see, God is a holy God and he can't have nothing to do with sin. I want y'all to check this now. He loves the sinner but hates the sin. And so when Jesus died, he took all of our sins upon himself. And when the righteous God looked down and saw his own son coming in sin, he turned his back on his son because his holiness could have nothing to do with sin. Y'all ain't catching what I'm throwing. I said... When God looked down and saw his own son, his only begotten son, who had now wrapped himself in sin, when he saw him coming, he turned his back on his only begotten son because he could not have anything to do with sin. All I'm trying to tell you is, God forsook his son so he would never have to forsake you. He rejected his son so he wouldn't have to reject you. He turned his back on his son so he wouldn't have to turn his back on you. He walked away from his son so he wouldn't have to walk away from you. There ought to be about five of y'all in here who can look back over your life and see what a mess you've been and say, God, thank you that you never turned your back on me. what you don't know. God had determined, you know what? I'm getting ready to shut this whole thing down. We got homosexuality running rampant in the land. I'm getting ready to shut it down. I've sent the prophets and they won't listen to it. I've tried to be numero uno in their lives, but they're worshiping and whoring after other gods. They turned their backs on me. God said, I'm getting ready to shut the whole thing down. But Jesus steps in. Jesus says, Wait a minute, Daddy. They didn't do it. I did it. God says, what do you mean? He says, I already know you. I know your characteristics. You are my son. You don't sin. They did it. Jesus says, no, Daddy. They didn't do it. I did it. It's right there in the text. Look, it says the chastisement of our peace, of our reconciliation was upon him. They didn't do it, Daddy. It was me. Right there, that same little house, 416 Abraham Street. I remember my mama would often have to work a lot. So that would leave me and my brother at house by ourselves. Right. And mama would say, look, I know you got stuff to do and I know you want to do stuff, but first thing we're going to do, before you go anywhere, before you do anything, just make sure that you clean up my house. She says, make sure that the house is clean. Now, some of y'all know Mark. It's a nice, smile-mannered, respectful, follow-the-rules kind of guy. Oh, but some of y'all know me, too. And there was one particular vase in the house. My mom said, look, clean up everything, but look, don't even worry about that. Don't touch that vase over there. I got it. Don't worry about it. And Mark, being who he was, he went to the work of cleaning and me being who I was, I went to the work of playing and running around the house. And running through the house, Mark working, I'm, I'm playing. Running through the house, Mark working, I'm playing. Wouldn't you know, I ran by this little nightstand and I hit the nightstand and knocked over the vase. And the vase broke. Mama came home. She walked in the house. She said, Mark, Sean, come here. And we stood side by side and looked at her. She said, who broke my vase? I ain't say nothing. <laughs> my mom was standing beside me. He ain't saying that. She said, who broke my vase? I 
ain't say nothing. Mark ain't said nothing. She said, who broke my face? And finally, Mark said, Mama, I did it. She said, boy, you lying. I know who broke the vase. I just wanted to tell me, who broke my vase? <laughs> I ain't say nothing. <laughs> Mark said, Mama, I broke the vase. She said, Mark, I know you ain't break the vase. I know how you are. I know how you care. So I know you didn't break. Who broke the vase? Tears start running down Mark's eyes. I'm standing there like. <laughs> he said, Mama, I broke the vase. She said, all right then. Since you broke the vase, this is what we're going to do. Mama went in the room, got an old leather belt, marched both of us back in the front. And before she did anything, she looked at me, she said, I know you ain't break She looked at Mark and said, I know you ain't break the vase, but since you want to take the blame, and looked at me and didn't say nothing. And she started whipping Mark. And tears was running down his face. And every time she would hit him, she would look at me. Every time she would strike him, she would look at me. Tears running down his face. She would hit him again, and she would look at me. She would strike him again as he was taking it, and she would look at me. Finally, tears started coming out of my eyes. She kept hitting him, but she kept looking at me. And guess what, y'all? That's the same thing Jesus did for us. Every time that they whipped him, he was looking at us. Every time they put another stripe on his back, he was looking at us. It wasn't his fault, but he took it for us. Every time he got bruised, they hit him, but they was looking at us. Is there anybody in the house this morning that can declare by the glory of God, God, I thank you that in the moments when I need you the most, you showed up and took every lick that I could not take. All God did while Jesus was on the cross was they allowed them, they were, he allowed them to whip him, but God was looking at us. They allowed him them to strike him, but God was looking at us. As the blood streamed down his side, that they, God allowed them to keep on mocking him, but he was looking at us. Somebody ought to shout to, to the glory of God and say, God, thank you that you gave me another chance. Thank you that you keep on making a way. And I don't know how you feel about it, but I'm glad that he took my place. Somebody ought to thank God that Jesus took your place. I said somebody ought to thank God that Jesus stepped in. All right. My knee telling me my time is up. Yeah. He helps us. He by lifting our burdens. He became liable for our bruises. But the third and final insight that we find in the text is that he liberates us from our bonds. His word says clearly, says by his stripes we are healed. Put me somewhere around E flat. I'm going to be ready in a minute. He took our punishment so we wouldn't have to. He took on what we could not have ever endured. He took it on for us. By his licks, we are healed. Every lick was like a payment for us. Some folks will try and tell you this refers to physical healing, but this has nothing to do with physical healing. It has to do with spiritual healing. 39 times they whipped my Savior. 39 times they beat him with a cat of nine tails. And every time they whipped him, and every time they beat him, it would tear flesh from his body. I tell you, he liberates us from our bonds. Simply because of the licks he took, those licks became our payment. <clears throat> he liberates us from that which oppresses us. The Lord liberates us from that which imprisons us. He liberates us from that which impels us, and he liberates us from that which incarcerates us. He liberates us from that which condemns us. And the Lord liberates us that, from that which confines us. He also liberates us 
from that which constricts us. All I'm trying to tell y'all this morning is simply is that the Lord, because of what he did, that the Lord sets us free. I tell you that because the Lord did what he did, it simply means that we all have a right to eternal life. I tell you in the words of the old church, he, he paid it all. Now some scholars want to argue that Jesus didn't pay it. They said God paid it all. You know, we all sing this song that says Jesus, he paid it all. And all to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain. But all he was, he was me right as so. Some folks want to say that Jesus didn't pay it, that he was just a pay victim. But there anybody here who got the same testimony as I do. I don't care who it is that paid it. I said, I don't care who paid it, whether it was God or Jesus. All I care about is the fact is that it's already paid. That the Lord, he's already already paid the bill. Is there anybody in here this morning that can say, God, thank you that you showed up and paid the bill. I got a story, y'all, and I'm going to take my seat. Story about a young preacher. Went to his first church and was hosting his first revival. He invited the old preacher down to run three nights of revival. Money was kind of funny and his change was kind of strange. But he said, I know that the Lord will supply. Last night a revival came, y'all. He decided he wanted to take the guest preacher down to the old market to get him something to eat. Sat down and told the preacher, order anything that you want is all on me. All the time, he knew that he had no money in his pocket. They ate and fellowshiped, and while they, after they had sat there for a while, the young preacher's daddy walked in the door, sat down at the table. He said, Daddy, how did you find me? He said, somebody told me that you was out with the old preacher. So they sat around, ate the food, and the young preacher was trying to figure out how am I going to pay the bill. He got up, y'all, took a walk to the bathroom and began to call out on the name of the Lord. Came back to the table and when he got back, he noticed that his daddy was nowhere to be found. He thought about it and then he sent for the waitress. He said, honey, can you please bring my bill? She looked at him, y'all, and said, sir, you don't got no bill. He said, oh, wait a minute, what are you trying to tell me? We done sat here and ordered all this food. She said, sir, you don't have a bill. He said, tell me what's going on. That doesn't make any sense. How can I order all this food, but I have no bill? She said, well, sir, the man that was sitting at the table, he already already, he already paid your bill. That's what I want to leave y'all with this morning, that if you trust in the Lord with all of the heart and lean not to that old understanding, but in all the ways acknowledge him, the Lord will come over and help me. I said the Lord will make a way somehow. Young man went home, called his daddy on the phone. He said, Daddy, how did you end up, end up paying the bill? He said, Son, I knew you was having hardship. He said, Son, I knew you couldn't take it. So I went ahead and paid your bill. Young preacher said, Well, Daddy, I can't pay you back right now. What can I do for you until I can pay you back? His daddy told him, Well, the one thing that you 
you can do for me since you can't since you can't pay me back he said you can just tell your daddy thank you for your grace and mercy somebody ought to tell God thank you that you keep on keep on the church is open because he has paid it all we have no debt of sin to pay Christ has done it all amen God bless you sir amen we certainly thank God for you all we hope that something was said on today that was a reminder for you <clears throat> uh, amen God bless you uh, I know it was you Sunday my goal today is, you know, oftentimes we tell kids, well, he died on the cross for your sins. Uh, the goal of the day for today was to paint a picture to let them know he did more than just die on the cross. I wanted you to see a picture of what he went through so that you have the right to be here today. So we hope that it was something that impacted your heart. Let us look to the Lord to be dismissed. God, gracious God, we thank you now for what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, and most of all, what our hearts have felt. We pray now that as we prepare to leave this place, but never from your presence, that you would continue to be that guiding light unto our feet and lamp unto our path. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before his presence with exceeding joy to the only wise God be glory, power, and dominion, both here on earth and in heaven. Let us all sing together.